Oh, I want my child to go back to daycare. Yeah. I had no free time. Understood. And now Sean's going to go pick him up. I've been living with that for two years. Oh, so like... Your children are a little less up your ass than mine is. They are. They uh, amuse themselves, but I'd still like them to leave the fucking house so I can get things done. Yeah. For a long time, I wasn't able to get anything done when they weren't home because that was when I felt like I had time to myself. See, and that's where mom guilt comes in because <laughs> I feel really guilty if I try to take time for myself. Mm. So I like, you know, I'll sit on the couch for a minute and then get really sad. <laughs> <sighs> I mean, I get my nails done. That counts, right? Sure. Except usually, actually, I've been going at a different time now and the really annoying girl is gone. So there's less people coming in with like bars and bars nails to get them fixed. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the, the annoying girl specialty. It's just, that's a lot of the clientele around here. I heard a phrase today. See, TikTok is good for something today. I learned the phrase spread necks. <laughs> What's that? They're the rednecks that are spreading germs, spreading COVID because oh, okay. they don't get the shots or think it's real. I thought maybe it was the ones that spread their legs. That's different. Yeah. <laughs> You feel like a pirate now? You look really upset. <laughs> it's uh, it's getting very rummy. Like, early on, it was like, oh, this is a nice balance, but now it's very rummy. Fire breath. I have that from the barbecue chips, I just like. Hey, everybody. It's the Booze and Spirits Podcast. It's like a drink with death or laryngitis or something. Asthma. The loogie in the back of your throat. That's about the noise you made as a child where mom and dad thought you had asthma. It's just fat. That was all that ever was. No, it was you trying to purr. Oh. <laughs> as, a, as a toddler, and they thought you had asthma, because you would just go, <sighs> all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'll buy that. It's that high McDonald palate where we can't roll ours with our tongues, so you got to use the back of your throat. <laughs> We're just too damn Scottish. Exactly. Just go straight to the brogue. Um, I'm Kate McDonald. Hey, introductions, and I'm Nick McDonald. I remembered, and you didn't. You didn't, and I do. Stop and it. I. I even have my cheat sheet open. I mean, I wasn't looking at it, but my cheat sheet is open. So, today, because this is going to be our last one that we record before we leave on vacation. So, who knows? This may be our last episode together. One of us may die horribly or vanish forever on this trip. Or we might just punch each other in the throat and then one of us can't talk anymore. (laughs) I might start swinging my arms like this. And And I'll just start kicking air. (laughs) Anyway, this is the last one before we go on vacation. I gotta pack all of the things a psychotic toddler could need. It's gonna take up my whole car. I've gotta bring a year and a half worth of birthday and Christmas presents with me. So maybe you guys take two vehicles? Uh, Leave one in Grant's Pass. You know, that's that would be smart. I don't know. We haven't discussed that, though. The kids will all want to go in the van because that's the one that has the DVD player. Mm. And then you and Kel can have a nice little road trip. Maybe. You can just drive by yourself. You can, like, chain smoke and do a bunch of coke on the drive. Stay awake. That's right. <laughs> you should go get an acrylic nail put on for ease of coke and traffic. Let's try to figure out what the uh, beer helmet equivalent of coke would be. Like, just a <laughs> cylinder with a hose going to your nose at the bottom. That's too much snorting. You don't want to snort. You, you Up don't your wanna, nose with a rubber hose. You don't want to snort long things. That's why you just... You gotta, well, no, but you breathe through your mouth until you're ready for a bump, and then... <laughs> Oh, so it's just like a Coke necklace. Well, it's, I mean, it's only going to... I mean, you don't just keep sniffing until you hit the bitter end. You only sniff as much as you want. You've obviously never done You got to have some control. You've here. obviously never done cocaine. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I know I just did like half of this, but I could do a little more. All right. <laughs> Back to topic at hand. Since we are just about to leave on vacation to uh, Yosemite, we decided the best way to prepare for that would to be covering missing 411 cases about Yosemite. (laughs) And then Katie hit her funny bone. Oh, shit. You wanted to just cover Yosemite cases? I thought that's what we were doing. That's not what I'm doing. 
Oh, okay. Well, I've got some Yosemite stuff. I can make something happen, but I just thought we were discussing... Katie's got some other missing 411. I thought we were just discussing missing 411. Well, we're... I mean, we're going to have to give, like, a precursor introduction to it, because I know not everyone is familiar with the whole concept. I mean, I feel like my winning story is from, like, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. It might have been from somewhere else, but that's where I'm thinking. I focused on Yosemite, which means that I don't have nearly as much thing to talk about as you probably do. Well... It's fine. I I, can... I thought that's why you got the West Coast book was so you could do Yosemite. I just wanted the West Coast book. Oh, fine. I can pull up Yosemite in here. I can read you a list. No. There's a list of all of the people. Let's let's before we get into actual cases, we should probably explain what Missing Four One One is for those who don't know. Missing Four One One is a series of books by David Politis, and what they are is he. But what's his story? Wasn't he, he's, he's an ex-law enforcement officer of some sort, I believe? Yeah, I think he was a cop and then a detective. Anyway, he started to notice that there's vast amounts of missing persons cases that are linked, I mean, largely to national parks, but for the most part to the wilderness. And he started to notice patterns that happen in these clusters and other things. And the more he investigated, the more frustrated he got because... There's just not a lot of information on these. Most of these national park ones, they they don't have the manpower or the resources, apparently, to keep accurate records on what's happening. Sometimes he's, in interviews, has kind of implied that he thinks that they're purposefully not keeping real accurate records on it. Like, it's something that he's never come right out and and said what his supposition of what's going on is, but he says that if you follow the cases, eventually you'll get the same impressions that he has. Most people kind of end up in the realm of Bigfoot fairy alien abductions that the government can't do anything about, so they just try to keep the information from getting out of hand. Well, and there's also the cluster connections typically correspond with underground cave systems. They do. We were watching, I put on Missing 411 The Hunted oh, earlier. I was going to watch. I watched watch it before, again. but I put it on this morning. Just yeah, so have I. But I wanted to rewatch yeah. him before we got to this. I but forgot to. Sean was watching it with me, and he wasn't familiar at all with my nonsense and conspiracy theories because you know I think he just blocks that out for his own mental health. Um, <laughs> but at one point in time, they pull up a map and they're talking about the clustered cases, and there's a big red dot where we live. <laughs> and he was like, "Of course, there's a cluster there." So, I do have a list here of uh, some of the common occurrences, and these don't happen in every case, but all these cases have a number of items from this list that end up on them. First is berries. Many people have disappeared while out berry picking, and uh, a lot of times when children or toddlers are victims of one of these cases, they're found either in berry bushes or with handfuls of berries. We mentioned the clustering. There's 52 locations in North America that David Politis has located as a cluster spot, and he's got eight or nine of these books out now. He's covered some cases from outside of North America, but generally that's what he focuses on. That's where he lives, so that's kind of uh, and his, what he's focused his in focus on. His focus is primarily the U.S., but he does go into Canada yeah. a little more and more as the series progresses, I feel like. Mm-hmm. So, uh, canines and bloodhounds. When these people go missing, of course, search and rescue forces are organized to come and and try to find them. A lot of times they'll bring in dogs or bloodhounds, scent hounds, and almost universally the scent hounds either can't find a scent or they start hesitating and refusing to search. Survivor victims, because not all these people survive, a, a lot of them are found dead, some of them are never found. Sometimes they do find surviving victims, but... Usually they're found in a state of semi-consciousness or unconsciousness, and they have a hard time remembering key pieces of their ordeal. They've got holes in their memory, or they got missing time, or things like that. they are disabled enough that they can't communicate, or young enough that they can't communicate. Yeah. And see, that's another thing, is these cases tend to fit to either end of the intelligence spectrum. A lot of times it's like we say that's toddlers or, or young people who don't have the ability to communicate. Sometimes it's people with mental disabilities that are unable to fully share what they're going. But the other end of that scale is that, and this is kind of increased in some of the later books, it's people of high intelligence and high intellect that go missing. A, a huge portion of those is primarily college-age men who have combined academic and athletic achievements, kind of your all-around alpha men. And it's worth being said that most of these disappearances happen in a split second. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people are walking with someone, they walk forward for five seconds, look behind them, and that person is gone. Yeah. 
it, it'll be someone in the lead or the end of a group who will just vanish. And, you know, there's been a few cases like somebody walks behind a tree and then they don't show back up like some kind of cartoon. Let's see. Another one is the distance. A lot of times victims are found remarkably long distances from where they went missing in the first place. And sometimes toddler, small children are found miles away or, or even... 15 miles, like not like yeah, two miles. Or even up in a hard to scale incline, someplace where they just shouldn't have been able to get to on their own. A lot of times their belongings will just reappear in random places or mm. they'll be found with belongings that aren't theirs that they don't know where they came from. Sometimes the person will still be missing, but two years later, they'll find their clothes nicely folded under a tree, showing no signs of age. Mm -hmm. Places they'll they find... searched suddenly show things that weren't there before. Including victims, there's been a lot of these cases where the search crew will go over an area and they'll pick through it and, and mark it as clear and then move on. And then later, the person is found in that area they've already gone through. The clothing, a lot of times, they'll be missing clothing items or, like, shoes. Or if you're lost in the woods, you could be suffering hypothermia, so you want to keep yourself warm. There are also incidents where people find that the belts have been placed on the pants in a way that doesn't make sense, like they're not going through the loops the way that one would expect. I guess on the rare occasions where a survivor victim has been recovered and reporters actually think to ask the doctor of their condition, they're almost always described as being healthy with just a little bit of a fever. They also, typically, if there's bodies found, the cause of death is either inconclusive or doesn't make sense. Yeah. And then there's a couple patterns that are from some of the more recent books. There's incidents of people going missing from inside buildings that are near these hot spots. There's been reports of children that have gone missing from homes with alarms, and the alarms have never been triggered. Another book also has a lot of cases of people seen entering bars and never coming back out of them. And another odd coincidence is that a lot of times the family and friends just assume that a crime has occurred. Like, rather than the concept of these people just simply getting lost, they assume something horrible has happened to them. I don't know, is there anything on that list that I forgot to mention? Yeah, not that I can think of at the moment, but I'm sure, like, right. halfway through... I'll have a YouTube Oh, yeah, moment. well, yeah, exactly. We'll have that. So you tracked down some of your favorite weirdo cases, right? That's what I'm left to understand? Yes. I was going for some of the creepier cases. Mm -hmm. So I was going to talk about Henry McCabe. Okay. I guess I'll tell the story before we get into the theories here. But this is one of the more recent ones. This took place in 2015. Henry McCabe was a Liberian immigrant. He moved to the United States and moved to California, where he lived in a Liberian-American community with his wife and two daughters. I believe they were married about 11 years at the time the story takes place. Then he got a job as an auditor for the Department of Revenue in Minnesota. So he moves to Mountain View, Minnesota. His wife is still in California, finishing up stuff with her job. There's some back and forth there, it seems like. Here's he was active in his community, happy intelligent, well-educated, outgoing, very family devoted. But then on September 6, 2015, he ran into an acquaintance, a friendly acquaintance from Liberia and decided to go out to get drinks with him. And yeah. it appears some other friends, they went to a nightclub about five minutes from where Henry was living at the club. Henry apparently went a little hard and so his friends took his keys in his wallet so he would not drive yeah. or buy more drinks. He got crunk with it. He got crunk with it. They left the club around 1.40 a.m., obviously. Mm -hmm. And Henry's friend offered to drive him home. Henry got into the car, but rather than go home, he requested that William take him to a gas station in the nearby town of Fridley. Which was a weird request because it's the opposite direction of Henry's house. I think it's just a few minutes the opposite direction of Henry's house, but it was away from his house. Important to note. Yeah. No one is really sure why his friend decided to just take the drunk guy to the gas station and drop him off without his wallet or keys. But that's what happened. Drunk people. Yeah. Because yeah. the not as drunk guy was trying to be responsible, but he was still drunk, would be my. <laughs> that's how I once ended up with a man's keys in my purse for a week because <laughs> my drunk ass didn't know I, t I remembered taking them from him so he wouldn't drive, but I didn't know where I put them. <laughs> Anyway. Blind leading the blind. The, yeah. not, so the they, not as blind leading the blind. Pretty much. So Henry's do dropped off at the gas station probably around 2 a.m. At approximately 2.28, Henry's wife receives an unsettling voicemail. 
features two minutes of strange, unintelligible moaning, groaning, screams, and animalistic growls. Towards the end, there's an abrupt moment of silence before a voice can be heard saying, stop it. And then the whole thing cuts off in the recording. Crazy. So we'll pull that up in a minute. So she's just kind of like, what the hell is that voicemail? But Henry doesn't show up to work the next day. So they start looking into it. They're like, oh, we should probably figure out where he went. Pro tip, right? Uh, just as an interruption here, the whole mm-hmm. TV thing about you have to wait 48 hours before you can declare a person missing is not real. Don't listen to that ever. Yeah. Surveillance footage shows Kennedy dropping Henry off at the gas station, although Kennedy was wrong about which gas station it was. So, <laughs> I, again, I think Kennedy was also a little, little, little lit here. Uh-huh. Little lit. Nope. But the gas station turned up no clues as to what had happened to him. They didn't have camera or not, anything like not that, that that was usable. That was usable. So, also, confusion ends up being a factor in a lot of these, too. Like, almost all. People are just, yeah, just inexplicably confused. Like, maybe they'll end up in a location they should know very well, but it just it just baffles them for some reason. Like, And I don't know if that's what happened to Kennedy here, but I'm saying that that's a potential, um, right. what do we call it? Cluster. No, not cluster. It is a cluster. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cluster. Cluster. Pop. Theme? Let's go theme. Theme. Patterns. Pattern. That was what I used earlier pattern. was pattern. But yeah. Theme, pattern, montage. So a large reward was offered to help find Henry. Massive searches were carried out in the area. Nothing came up until November 4th when McCabe's body was discovered bobbing about face down in Rush Lake in New Brighton by a kayaker six miles from where he had been dropped off. An autopsy came to the conclusion that he had drowned. There was no outward injuries, no internal injuries, no signs of a struggle. But him drowning makes no sense with the voicemail anyone heard. And stop it. So the police in that area did come out and say that Henry was having marital and financial issues. So he probably just got too deep down in his depression and took his own life by walking into the lake. Uh-huh. With all of that voicemail. Does it, did anyone, does it say anything about if Stop It was his voice or someone else's? Is there any? I haven't seen any specification. It is a man's voice. So I think there, that it could be his, but they don't okay. say either way. Sure. I did read somewhere that the, voicemail pinged off of a tower that was not the closest to one to the gas station. It pinged Mm. in a few miles away from there as well. Yeah. There's a lot of people say that either he killed himself or it was a drug deal gone bad was the other thing I saw. But typically, like, maybe they do it differently in Liberia, but usually when you murder someone in the United States, there's at least something that indicates it was murder. It doesn't do a lot of good to send a message if you don't let people know that they were yeah. murdered <laughs> which and, and if you're gonna have a drug related murder then that's usually why you do it so that somebody says hey don't fuck right with me. so i actually haven't listened to the voicemail yet i thought it would be fun to do that together oh, all right. and let's see i don't think they released the entire the voicemail in its entirety you said it was like a couple minutes wasn't it but yeah there are two minutes worth of noises bizarre ones But very little actual talking. Authorities confirmed the disturbing middle-of-the-night call came from Henry McCabe's cell phone. Who does? It was Labor Day, September 7th at 2.28 in the morning. The tortured grunts suddenly stop. There is silence. Then someone, either Henry or another person, says... Stop it. The message is one piece of evidence Moundsview police are reviewing. The police chief tells me even the FBI is analyzing the recording and voices for clues. So, yeah, I don't know how a voicemail like that could be left the night someone goes missing and then have it ruled not suspicious. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's, uh, that gets the hairs on your neck standing up. <laughs> like, the dog literally ran in here in a panic. Yeah. From And he wasn't even, like, he was out in the other part of the house. Yeah. So that's the Henry McCabe story. Well, that's uh, terrifying. Yeah. So, like I said, I uh, forgot about the Yosemite thing, so I rolled with that. <laughs> All right. Did you have any other super creepy ones going for? Um. Well, I, I did pull up a list that I enjoyed that is um, 10 of the creepiest stories. And then these are all ones where they were found alive. Yeah. I feel like you don't want to hear 10. This one I really liked. 
this might fall back on the end of an, you know, the high intelligence thing. Mm-hmm. In February 77, a 24-year-old man named Stephen Kubaki was cross-country skiing through snow near Lake Michigan. Once he reached the edge of the lake, he took his skis off to sit down and rest. When he got up to leave, his own tracks were gone, and he became lost. The last thing he remembers was walking through the snow, feeling numb and exhausted. He blacked out, and in the blink of the eye, it was spring. He was lying in a grassy field in the middle of a forest, sitting next to a stranger's backpack containing running shoes and glasses that were not his own. So he hiked to the nearest town and asked a local resident where he was. They told him he was in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, 700 miles away from where he'd been skiing. (laughs) His aunt lived in Pittsfield, so he knocked on her door. The family was in shock, asking him where he'd been. He'd been missing for 14 months. Holy cow. When uh, Kubaki first went missing, the search team found his poles and skis at the edge of the lake. There was only one set of footprints leading towards the water, but none walking away, so they expected assumed he drowned himself in the freezing lake. There's another one. Gonna walk into the lake and drown, guys. Yeah. Anyway, he had been missing for so long that everyone rightfully assumed he was dead. Right. The official explanation was that he had amnesia, but even the doctors were baffled by the case because it's incredibly rare for someone to lose their memory of such a large chunk of time. And there's a lot of unanswered questions there. So Kubaki had a degree in linguistics before he went missing. But he was so fascinated by what happened to him that he got a PhD in psychology mm-hmm. to figure out the answers to his own disappearance. He thinks it had something to do with an alternate universe. He wrote a book called Metamathematical Foundations of Existence, Godel, Quantum, God, and Beyond. This man was so panicked by what happened to him, rightfully so, yeah. that yeah. he has been studying it, trying to figure it out. And, you know, I, it's something I, I don't know if I've said on the podcast, but I say to person to person all the time, I'm a big believer that people and objects just kind of jump through dimensional space all the time without any rhyme or reason. There's a lot of, uh, not necessarily 401 stories, but if you search um, the Oz effect, a lot of times people will find themselves in an area that just doesn't seem right. Like this, it sounds different. It feels different. The, the lighting looks a little weird. Well, and like, you know, a lot of these stories, do involve Yaw's effect when they have witnesses like suddenly there's just no signs of wild animals anywhere mm-hmm. and it's it's weirdly quiet and then they hear a weird noise they can't identify and and this these kinds of stories also always make me think back to uh boy i don't remember when it was i want to say it was uh 14th century europe although i could have that timeline wrong but a village found a pair of children in the woods that were completely colored green like their skin and hair was green all over and they spoke a language that nobody understood and over time staying with the people in the village they you know they learned the the local language and they ate the the local food and they they started to gain like a a more human color to them and they had some vague memories of who they were with before they ended up outside this village, but it's it's just very much a, did these people fall through a fucking hole in space-time and end up in another dimension? What the hell's happened here? Yeah. And then I'll just do one more of the found alive stories. So, in February 2018, a Canadian man named Danny Philippides, I might be saying that wrong, if I ever fuck up a name. Sorry, guys, this is just who I am. <laughs> if someone corrects me, I'll figure it out, but Just going off of words here. Tommy felt a penis. Danny Filipitas was on a ski trip with his friends in New York. It was around 2 p.m. and they'd been skiing for hours. They're getting ready to go into the lodge and Danny said he wanted to go one more run down the mountain before their lunch break. By 4 p.m. they were all like, where the hell did Danny go? They tried calling him. They began searching for him. And then they ended up telling the lodge employees, ski lodge employees, that he was missing. So a team of 130 people scoured the mountain without finding him. Six days later, Philippides' wife receives a phone call from a number she doesn't recognize. It sounded far away and staticky, and it was Danny's voice. He was incoherent and confused and then hung up the phone. She called the number back and pleaded with him to call 911 for help, so he did. He had no idea where he was. He just described his surroundings. The paramedics finally found him. He was still wearing all of his ski gear and in need of medical assistance. He was holding a brand new iPhone that was not his, and someone had cut his hair. Hmm. And the most interesting part of the story is he was found in Sacramento, California. (laughs) At the car rental depot at the airport. Crazy. 
He doesn't know when we got there. He didn't know what day it was. When he learned from the people that came to help him how long he had been missing and where he was, he became incredibly emotional. The theory behind his missing time is uh, he was kidnapped and put in the back of a big rig truck, but there's like zero evidence to corroborate that. Yeah, he's got no memories that of anything like that. Or Yeah. Crazy. So, and I mean, a lot of the missing 411 people do lean towards, you know, the alien side of things and staticky distant phone calls also fall well into that category. So. Yeah, that's true. So I got, because I focused more on Yosemite. Which um, was apparently the plan, and, but Kate had to go and fuck it up. Oh, that's what I thought. But And I, I, also, I purposefully didn't use the West Coast book that uh, has a lot of the Yosemite cases, because I knew that was the book that you were going to be using. In so, <laughs> So, uh, the books that I was looking through, because like I said, there's like eight or nine of these books. There was only one direct Yosemite case, and that was the story of George Pinka. He's 30 years old. He disappeared in June 17th, 2011 from Yosemite. He was part of a church group that decided to hike the Upper Yosemite Falls on the return trip. George brought up the rear of the group and lagged behind and was just never seen again. He never showed up. Now, interestingly, the Upper Yosemite is one of the busiest trails in the park. So it's kind of hard for him to go just completely unseen on this super busy trail. Oh, that was something that I only barely touched on was that a lot of times in David Politis' books, he kind of it goes on a little rant about how hard it is to get information on uh, a lot of these things. Sometimes he'll ask for, hey, can I get these case files? And they say, yeah, um, we can, but it's going to cost you like $250,000 in man hours to do all this. So it's up to you if you want that. So, you know, he doesn't have a quarter million lying around to do that. So he just kind of lets it slide. According to the book, this case, the George Pinka case, there is on record 250 pages of information on the case, and he requested those through the Freedom of Information Act, but he was only granted the missing poster that was posted of George Pinka due to it being an open law enforcement case, despite the fact that he's gotten full files on many open law enforcement cases on the past, and this one they decided to stonewall him on. I did get some... Yosemite cases from the past couple months. These are not official missing 411 cases, but they may end up being that after uh, some further investigation. So on July 20th, 2021, Fred Zalikar was found dead near the 11,527 foot summit of Mount Clark. He was last seen hiking off trail on July 17th between Happy Isles and Mount Clark. Now, Zalikar is a world record endurance athlete. He's climbed 185 of the world's highest peaks in 85 countries. He's won six world-level marathons in his age group. So he was no slouch as far as athletics or the outdoors goes. He had plans to break the American record at the USA Track and Field Masters Outdoor Championships later that week. As of July 22nd, which was the most recent article I could find, they still had not revealed any cause of death, though one source reported a family friend claimed that he'd fallen. Uh, Zalkar was a native of nearby Reno, Nevada, and he was quite familiar with Yosemite National Park. It was kind of his home turf. A couple others really recently, on June 25th, experienced High Sierra hiker James Youngblum, age 64, was found dead in... Laconte Falls, and uh, Young Blom was a professor. Oh, I forget what university he was at, but he was he was a professor at a major university. So again, here's another individual who's a high intellect, high athletics. As of July 21st, still no cause of death had been announced, and this is the most recently. This just happened this week, so there's not a lot of details yet. The week of this recording, 72 year old Richard Judd was separated from his hiking partner and disappeared on July 25th. And there's not a lot of details in that yet because it's just happened. So, um, I mean, I'm a little bit farther north, but there was a kid this week that went missing on the Pacific Crest Trail when he was hiking with his dad, a 17-year-old. He was found about three days later by a helicopter, and I believe he is okay. But yeah. just like, suddenly they're there, suddenly they're gone. We'll find out more about this in the future. 
<laughs> so the other end of this, uh, uh, something I wanted to investigate is we do have a case of a hiker who got lost recently. I wouldn't call this a missing 411, but it's uh, just interesting as a counterpoint to see his experiences compared to these missing 401s, just so we can kind of see. We're trying to trying to establish some sense of normality here, because being lost in the woods is not normal in any way, shape, or form for us these days. So this is the case of a uh, Roseburg native, Roseburg, Oregon native, our hometown, Harry Burley. He disappeared on May 5th, 2021, after an overnight fishing trip at Tokety Lake. So that's kind of why this case jumped out at me. It's from mine and Kate's home area. It's an area we know. We know the Tokety area. It's, it's, so this is stuff that we can wrap our own personal heads around. The point of reference for us. Yeah, it is. Well, and, and that's, that's what I'm trying to establish here because we have all these weird, you know, all this crazy crap that happened to these people. And some things, you know, kind of make sense. Like people do remove clothes when they get hypothermia because they start to feel like they're getting warm, even though they're not really. So things like clothing coming off can sometimes make a little bit of Taking sense. Taking off their shoes seldom makes sense in these scenarios, but you know what? I, it I have neuropathy in my feet. They get really hot for no explainable reason. I get it. Well, and, 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 you know, we'll get to this story and he ended up having some shoe problems. So Harry went out on May 5th to go on this overnight fishing trip. He woke up the next morning. He was fishing from his kayak on Tokety Lake. He didn't have very much success. And, uh, a storm came in, which I mean, that's another thing that we forgot is Mother. a lot of times. Yeah. A lot of times in the missing 411, part of the pattern is inclement weather or just sudden weather, like a sudden storm that just kind of comes out of nowhere. In Harry's case, it got really windy and it was starting to rock his canoe. So he decided to get off the lake and pack it up. He started driving home on Highway 138 out of the Cascade Mountains. There's still plenty of daylight, though. So he decided he would, on the way, try his luck at Twin Lakes. So he drove to the Twin Lake trailhead. It was about four in the afternoon. He filled out a sign-in card and he left the note on his dashboard. I'll be back tonight. So his plan was he was just going to go up the trail to Twin Lakes, which is about a mile and a quarter. He's going to make a few casts and then just head right back. So all he took was the clothes on his back and his pole. He didn't take his backpack. He didn't take water. He didn't take a compass. He didn't take his hat. He didn't take his extra shirt. He was wearing layers at the time, but he had extra layers packed in just in case. But he didn't bring them with him because he figured he was going to be gone two hours at he the most. He should have at least taken water. What are you thinking? He briskly hiked up the trail. And soon hit where the snow line started to overlap the trail markers. And uh, this is where he believes he missed his turn and ended up going off trail without realizing it. As light began to fade, he realized he was lost and he was likely spending the night in the woods. And since he'd kind of rushed down the trail, it made it a little hard for him to recall the details and landmarks he had passed. He tried to make some assumptions following canyon curvatures, but he thinks that just got him even more off track from where he wanted to be. He uh, said, this is a quote, I felt like I knew where I was at, that I had terrain awareness, but I didn't. He made a makeshift shelter for the night on the side of the hill, um, but he didn't sleep at all. <laughs> he uh, just kind of sat there waiting for a first light. First light came and he be it began to snow. But at least he was had enough light now he could at least realize what area he was in. He was ironically in the Deception Creek area. He still didn't have enough landmarks to get himself out of it, though, unfortunately. He knew he was on his own to get out now. He couldn't count on, you know, a trail or someone just happening upon him because he is too far out in the brush. He at one point spotted a rock ledge with two logs that had fallen and we're leading down into the ravine, and he figured, well, I need some water. I'm going to head to the ravine. So he tried to shimmy down one log and slipped, and he fell and hit his head on the second log, and also landed on his hip where he had his fishing reel attached. So now he's on the ground. He's got a head wound. <laughs> his hip's jacked up. He realizes the situation's just got infinitely more serious, you know? So he's trying to get his head straight. You know, he's having trouble focusing. He's trying to be mindful. He's trying to gain situational awareness, which is a key point of being in the wilderness by yourself. Four days in, he'd found himself at the confluence of two creeks. He hadn't eaten, but at least he had gotten water. He would built himself a small shelter out of branches. And uh, at one point, he realized he didn't need his underwear. <laughs> so, 
So he decided to go commando and take them off, and he sewed one leg hole shut so he could put it on his head as a hat to help hold in body heat. I mean, not the worst <laughs> idea. It's really like, not. Like, he, his mind is working as hard as it can to keep him alive. At one point, he heard an overhead plane and uh, tried to signal it by waving his sweatshirt around. He had his car keys with him, so he was trying to make them glimmer, but he wasn't seen, unfortunately. He had tried to start a fire, you know, rubbing sticks together, but he wasn't able to get it going. He said that before they would ignite, they ended up getting actually too hot for him to hold mm. anymore. This is, this is the crazy part. So he remembered a gift his father-in-law had given him 40 years ago, like a credit card-sized plastic magnifying glass. His father-in-law told him, here, put this in your wallet. You may need it someday. <laughs> and sure as shit, he did. Over the years, whenever Harry got a new wallet, he'd take the, the magnifying glass out, put it in the new wallet, and here he is 40 years later. He had he needed this fucking magnifying <laughs> glass. And yes, it helped him build a fire. It's very prophetic and amazing. <laughs> so he built a fire, but unfortunately, he burned through all his wood in one night. Uh, it didn't last nearly as much as he'd hoped it would. He tried to create a smoke signal with moss, you know, to try to attract attention. But the canyon winds dissipated it too fast for that to be a sufficient plan. So he decided he was going to climb back up to the ridge and try to make an SOS signal out of logs. But he soon found himself getting overheated and dehydrated. He did get to the point where he resorted to drinking his own urine, but it just wasn't enough. So he's kind of left with this conundrum because the only way he's going to be seen is up on the ridge, but all of his water sources are down in the ravine. <laughs> so what do you do? Like, you don't want to keep going back and forth up the hillside every single day. You're just going to keep blowing your energy reserves. So he had that to deal with. He eventually decided he needed to abandon this creek shelter, um, which ironically, Search and Rescue did find after he'd abandoned it. And before they found him, they found his shelter, but they <laughs> he was moved on since then. He tried to follow a creek that he thought would take him back to Twin Lake, and therefore the original trail he got lost from and his car. He ended up finding a sheer cliff with a waterfall and what looked like a potential trail to the top, but it was awful daunting for a starved, tired 69-year-old man. <laughs> he took a couple serious tumbles on the way up, and uh, about halfway up, his sandal disintegrated. Mm. Because he, he didn't have shoes on. He was wearing uh, hiking sandals and wool socks. Was As you do in Oregon. This is a normal thing, just so well, everyone is aware. Like I say, he wasn't expecting to do off-trail hiking. He was, you know, going to take these nice, easy trails to a couple fishing holes and be on his way. So, yeah, one of the sandals had completely disintegrated and fallen apart on the hike up. And he also managed to get a, a stick jammed and twisting his, his ankle further injuries on top of everything else that's happening. He made it to the top of the cliff and the waterfall, miraculously, and <laughs> as he did, he heard the sound of a search helicopter flying overhead. Unfortunately, he was in too much underbrush. He ended up rushing to the closest clearing he could find to make himself visible, but he did it too late and the chopper had just missed him. He kept Trying to progress up higher where he could be visible, he made it to another ridge top and made a shelter out of fallen limbs. Uh, this one was a bit lucky because he'd found a tree that had snapped off from the weather, and it had a hollow in it that it had collected rainwater. So it was kind of gross brown water with mosquito larva and wood but chips in it. But water was water at this point. Water was water. He nicknamed it his little teapot. He ate the larva. He'd been eating bugs where he could this whole time because that was the only protein he was going to get in this situation. Harry said he began basically powering himself by love, is what he'd said. He'd focus all his love to take a step, gather as much as he could again, and expend it to focus it into another step, and that was just kind of how he progressed this oh, whole time. Oh, you can time. do that with love? I do that with sheer stubbornness. I'm trying to get to <laughs> He said love. I mean, we're more spiteful True. than the average person, so yeah, like, <laughs> cussedness might be our, uh, our version okay. of love. <laughs> On May 23rd, he ended up hearing a man bellow in the woods, and it took all the energy he could muster to yell back. Uh, luckily, the man was part of the search and rescue party, so he came rushing, he helped Harry sit down. Uh, a second man arrived, and he helped hold Harry up while the first man put fresh socks on Harry's feet. If anyone's not aware, clean, warm socks are an imperative. <laughs> if you haven't watched Forrest Gump. Well, also, like, like just a side yeah, note, like... Yeah. There's nothing nothing that a homeless shelter needs more 
than fresh, clean socks. Like, that's something that people go through in a hurry. A third search and rescue man showed up and he gave Harry a Gatorade, which Harry later described as God's own stash of honey. I like this guy. Yeah. (laughs) So Harry ended up spending 12 days in ICU for malnutrition, dehydration, hypothermia, gastrointestinal issues, and a significant amount of foot trauma. After he was released, he still had significant nerve damage in his feet and was walking with a cane, but the doctor supposes that damage should heal and subside over time. So that's a comparison of someone who we know was lost in the woods. They never really had anything really paranormal or off or supernatural sounding happen to them other than his father-in-law predicting he's going to need a magnifying glass at some point in his future. You know, it sounds like he was an outdoorsman. It makes sense. (laughs) It does. So that's just kind of a comparison point to see what happens in a normal situation when someone gets stuck out in the woods compared to what happens in some of these 411 cases. Anything to add to that? Yeah. I mean, he he wasn't found 300 miles away with somebody else's cell phone, so. No, he wasn't. Um, I did find something interesting because I'm obviously in Oregon and I'm not large cluster in the crater lake area too, crater lake national park in that area yeah and those typically aren't women which i thought was interesting to be fair we can just assume most of these people getting lost in the woods are men because there's more men going to hunt and fish yeah but one of the stories that corresponds to crater lake is outside of gold hill where the oregon house of mystery is and i think she was like a marine or something an ex-marine this like five foot 110 pound woman went missing and she's one of like the only women to go missing in this circumstance in this area and they think it might be because far away she looked like a just a very small man because she had like a really short haircut and was super athletic i remember reading some of those stories or like where a a smaller man might be interpreted as a child or a teenager or a smaller or smaller woman smaller people in general yeah so i just i thought that that was interesting that mostly mostly men even when there yeah. are women. So that's kind of just a, a surface sliver of some of the missing 401 stuff, which I, I really do suggest everyone checks it out because it's really fascinating. And there's a lot of stuff that David Politis has collected over the years. Like I said, there's eight books. There's a couple documentaries. I think they're both on Prime right now. Um, um, I could be wrong. I think... They're, I think they're both on Hulu right now. Yeah, so definitely check those out. And, and you know, also, like I said, it's, it's kind of a tie-in. If you've never heard of it, you might want to check out the Oz effect. That's not a name thing. That's just kind of like a term people use for when they end up in these mysterious environments. Yeah, you can, I mean, we could probably devote a podcast to the missing 411 phenomenon. Not just like an episode, but like episodes no. and episodes and episodes. Like it's a, it's a pretty... I find it really interesting. I have noticed that it's getting a little trendier with the TikTok conspiracies because, you know. Yeah, but it sounds like it sounds like whenever TikTok locks into something. They don't do it right. Like when they try to hex the moon. Well, here's the thing that I've noticed from the TikTokers. The TikTok. The TikTok is that their patience for studying something only goes as far as a 40 second TikTok. So they don't bother to look too heavily into things so they end up spreading they end up spreading an awful lot of misinformation because they're only willing to put a 40 second tiktok videos worth of investigation into a agreed situation. like there are like there are some great things you can learn off of tiktok but take it all with a grain of salt i don't think that there yeah. are uh, feral human cannibals kidnapping these people i know that's that's a current no, that theory was, that- that's the plot to The Hills Have Eyes. That's not- I mean, I'm not saying there's no <laughs> feral cannibals. There's very likely feral human cannibals somewhere in the woods. In there's America. probably a couple around here. I know. But I doubt that there's 52 colonies of them and nobody's right, done anything exactly. about it. I mean, to be fair, Southern Oregon can be as like, you know, the Appalachians can be a little little sketchy. I'm sure other parts of the nation <laughs> are. Those are just the ones I'm familiar with. But I don't. Southern Oregon, you know what? When I was a kid, you did not go places if you didn't know where you were going because you were liable to have someone put a very aggressive gun in your face for getting too close to their pot grow or their mushroom store or, you know, whatever. I mean, there's even, like, in Southern Oregon. Mine still. As well as I'm, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's gold panners out there who will kill you to keep you away from whatever they consider to be their claim. Like, And, I mean, I feel like in the... Since we were in the, in the past, you know, 20 years or so, I feel like it's simmered down a little bit. That just doesn't seem to be happening nearly as much, but that can only account for so many stories. 
Well, I think I think the problem now is that for Southern Oregon is that we've got a lot of illegal grow operations on top of the legal grow operations that can end up being well. A problem. And I mean, like most of these stories weren't from Southern Oregon for recent years, but no. they have definitely they're definitely dealing with like a cartel presence here now that they're trying to nip in the bud, and I expect that yeah. to get worse before it gets better. But again, just Southern Oregon, and that's just an extension of like the. Uh, what is it, Medicino Mountain or, or whatever it is in California, Medicino. like in Humboldt County? Yeah, that's just, you know, that's just an expansion of that whole problem that they've had there for decades. I mean, people so. go missing here because they, they did stupid stuff, but there's also people that go missing at Crater Lake, and that is a little different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. People probably go missing for stumbling on weed crops in other parts of the nation. Oh, I'm sure they do. But this is, you know, a lot of these... I think we're 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 walking this hand around the same bush over and over again. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> All right. I got a drink. You got a drink? It didn't go missing. It wasn't kidnapped by alien Bigfoots. I probably drank it already. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't drank it already. I haven't been able to drink very much lately. So. Just been too busy. No, it just gets me. I get really nauseous. Oh, is that your drinking less fun? Prednisone. I think it's probably from eating too many things. I'm allergic to. You know, mildly allergic to things. You just eat too many of them, and then you just feel like garbage for an extended period of time. Oh. Yeah. Or mom's doing voodoo to get me pregnant again. It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Um, anyway. I don't know that's a great idea. So I am uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it to some wilderness-inspired beverage here. Kick it. Kick it. Um, so I think I'm going to roll with Rainier Gin here. Yeah. Because it's appropriate. It is. And I love it. Vitamin R. The harder version of vitamin R. <laughs> vitamin R concentrate. And then uh, I have... R plus. Vitamin R plus. Yeah. I have... I picked up a while ago this Bruce Tip Jelly that I knew I needed for some reason, but I couldn't figure out what to do with it. So... So, so we're just drinking trees, like, straight up here. Fuck, I love to me. drink trees. I'm really... <laughs> really upset about one time mom and I went into the Total Wine or something in Olympia and they had a Douglas fir liqueur that we did not buy. I haven't lived that down to myself since. But um, I feel like we could make that. We could make that. I'm not sure which part of the tree to use, but I can I can help you with that. But I'm gonna do uh, so. My plan here is I'm gonna uh, shake some gin with some ice and I think some fresh blackberries because that also plays in very well here. Does blackberry and pine go together? I don't see why not, okay. but I may recant and pull the blackberries. We'll see. <laughs> That's fair. And I said spruce. Oh, okay, sorry. You know, it's sorry. hard It's hard to find, like, official suggestions for what to pair spruce with. I'm sure. But I, Well, this this will be a, a good way to keep people from, you know, copying a recipe and saying it's their own. I read that, uh, from some chef that uh, they recommended comparing it to mint and or melon. So, See mint. That my mind went to you know what goes with mint, which blackberry goes. Blackberry with mint, goes so. with mint, and blackberry would be fine with melon. So if you know what, it may not pan out, but we're going to give it a whirl because it is fresh blackberry season in Southern Oregon. There's a lot of berries in these four one one books. My Tim Gunn would say, "Make it work." My child keeps going outside to pick blackberries. And you're never too young to learn to forage. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna. My plan is to like muddle the blackberries. Throw the gin in, shake it with the spruce tip jelly and some ice. Like a hard-boiled egg. Shake it like a hard-boiled egg. And then uh, top it with soda water. So nothing too fancy. I'm thinking it might need a little lemon or a little honey or simple syrup. we got to play around there to find out specifically what we want to do with that. But uh, I think it'll be pretty yummy because I like to chew on trees. I like to hug them. (laughs) I like to talk to them. I like what they taste like. Fucking weirdo. (laughs) All right. Coo, coo, coo. It's the end of the show. This is where we talk about what we're going to do next episode, but I really don't know. We have no plans. Wahaha. Well, we don't know what our next episode is going to be. Like I said, we're going to try. I, well, I'm going to try to record something over the vacation. Here. I'm just going to drunkenly um, yell things from the background. That's how I get through family vacations. That's fine by me. I wish that's how I could get through family vacation, but I always end up having to be like the grown up, the responsible one. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I don't recommend bullshit. that. Bullshit, fucking bullshit. So 
we'll try to record something from on the road. And that's, you know, I don't even know what that might be. It might just be drunken hangman for all I know. <laughs> we'll just get Mel drunk and let her ramble. I think that's... Well, I, that's kind of what I was like wondering. I was like, huh, maybe if we can get Mel and Kel... And, uh, I was like, Bell. something else that rhymes with that? <laughs> Art Bell, he's dead, though, I think. <laughs> just get them to ramble on some stories that might be worth it. Or, you know, we'll we'll see what we so can Kel, come up with. I don't feel like Kel has a lot of paranormal stories. I feel like Kel's worked very hard to not have paranormal stories. Minus, like, one Kel time works... having, like, a daisy grow on her mom's grave. Kel doesn't believe in ghosts, other than theater ghosts. Like, and I don't understand how she's able to make that disconnect. There's a lot about her mind and the way it disconnects. I don't understand. Fair enough. So she believes in she believes in theater ghosts. She's seen theater ghosts. She's heard theater ghosts, but she doesn't believe in ghosts. So Mel, I don't know about. I, I, I don't just know she I, any stories. I'm sure. I'm sure mom has some stories. You know, it'd be if we could get dad to speak on some stories. I mean, dad's got some, some good stories, but honestly, I, I know don't he know does, if, but he doesn't like. He doesn't to, like to talk about them, and I genuinely don't know if he remembers them anymore. Um, that's fair. Maybe he'll just make some. That's, I mean, that's, that's a. Okay. I feel like he makes Pocket. up new stuff all the time. Let's make up some ghost stories. Um, should, we should be all sent right. away now. Uh, check us out on the, the socials, the social medias. Boom! We're almost social. We're not really social. I'm social sometimes. You're social sometimes. I don't know. Sometimes I'm social. Our show notes will have... I guess we'll have some, some links to David Politis, uh, Missing 411... We'll have some links to where you can find his books. We'll have links to his YouTube channel, which his YouTube channel is kind of more focused on uh, Bigfoot. He does hunting, some Bigfoot I hunting. I don't know. Maybe he's got, he does he's do got, some Bigfoot He's got hunting. a couple couple things in the fire, that one. He's got some fingers and some pies. It's <laughs> some Bigfoot pie, but also... Bigfoot pie. I forgot I was going with that. Like, that's where you buy his books from. It's from his Bigfoot website. Which, But that's the only place you need to buy them because, A, he gets all the money, and B, they're reasonably priced. If, like, you try to get them on Amazon, they're like 150 bucks, yeah. and most of that money is not going to him. It's Ooh. going to whoever's reselling and his books. So. if they find out you're a reseller, they shut you down. He will come after you with his attorneys. That's right. They will crash Jeff Bezos' spaceship right into your ass. That, uh, you need a lot of lube for that one. Maybe Jeff Bezos, because because part of like his space trip was he uh, took the oldest person into space and the youngest person into space. So maybe he was just trying to exercise the planet. He took an old priest and a young. Are person. they both priests? No, that we know of. And but if, I don't if this feel is, like you're supposed. If this is a secret I mean, mission. I there's a pedophile joke there. I know there is. <laughs> Moving along. A good pedophile joke can be squeezed in anywhere. So. But um bump. Bump bump bump. Um, going to hell. Check out our show notes. We'll have links to that stuff. We'll have links to our socials. We'll have links to where you can support us. We will... Rock you. Na, 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 na. That's all I got. You got something to add? My foot's real warm. I go through the big spiel about, oh, you can support us through Patreon and Spotify or uh, Anchor and blah, 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 but no one cares. So, I just don't feel like I got through the effort anymore. Fuck Buy it. some shirts, though. Fuck y'all. I do need to make some more shirts. I've had a few t-shirt ideas floating around my head I need to put together, but I don't know what You know what I was thinking? I, I was like, I would like a shirt like that. And I'm like, I probably just could upload that to our site and then I could order it. And then if no one else wants it, oh, well, that's where we're at with life. That's right. <laughs> Fuck it, we're by shirt. Not, not necessarily ourselves. related to the podcast, just a general idea. I've had that thought too about this has nothing to do with this podcast, but I know how to make a shirt out of it. Pretty much. Print my little Orphan Annie fanfic on the back. Just big old, just, big old oval team logo on the front. I like it. Please drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Oval teen is allowed. That's not against the law anywhere, to my knowledge. I'm here to help. What if you, what if you fill it with full of vitamin R? I just don't think gin and chocolate milk go together. I, I didn't say that they do. I didn't say it was a good idea. <laughs> I, just I can said. make better suggestions if that's your plan. Okay, for the oval teen or the vitamin R, both probably. You tell me what your plan is. I'll tell you how to make it better. We'll make a flight, you know, with one vitamin R drink and one Ovaltine drink and then a couple other things that we just randomly gibberished about. Might be a little dog slobber in there. It's really hard to say. <laughs> we, we call that shot the 23 and me. It's just a shot glass full of dog slobber. <laughs> <laughs> I've been really drooly at my house lately with Killian getting a tooth and my dog being on drugs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I said please drink responsibly and... Oh. You missed the cue. You missed the cue. 
Don't end up on a goat. Line. I saw a picture of a puppy. I'm sorry. Line. <laughs> no, it was a puppy. It was fuzzy. Supersedes ending, so, ending the show. So fluffy, I want to die. Sometimes <laughs> I wish I was drinking for a hat, so I had a reason for the reason. A reason for the reason. A reason for the way I act this way. I actually think that our shows are a little more off kilter when we're not drinking, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go Alrighty. get my Amazon returns box while my child's not here. Okay. Biggie. Right. Me. Me.